Hey, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday before Memorial Day. There's going to be a lot of cookouts and trips planned, and each year on the final Monday in May, the United States celebrates the federal holiday, Memorial Day. Originally, Memorial Day was known as Decoration Day. It was meant to honor the Union and Confederate soldiers who died during the Civil War. By the 1900s, it had become a day to celebrate all American soldiers who died while serving in the military. And it wasn't a national holiday until 1967. And it was, well, excuse me, 1971. Now, some more facts about it. Approximately 620,000 soldiers died on both sides during the Civil War. It was bloodletting that had never been seen before in the scale and the range of the war. And in 2000, Congress passed a law that requires all Americans to stop what they're doing at 3 p.m. on Memorial Day. Has anyone ever noticed, like, if you watch some television or something on Memorial Day and then there comes, like, a little pause or silence in? I never realized that's what that was. The flag is supposed to be flown at half mast until noon and raised to full mast until sunset. It's common for volunteers to place the American flag on graves in national cemeteries, local cemeteries. Imagine up at Dolly Cooper Cemetery, up there by the Campbell Nursing Home. They'll be doing that. Approximately 32 million people travel by car. Don't know about that number this year. Because uh, gas prices, no, uh, no comment on that one. Also marks the beginning of the summer vacation season. Runs through Labor Day, so ladies, y'all can wear your white starting tomorrow. On through Labor Day. Some parts of the South, they still hold decoration days. It was a precursor to Memorial Day. Sometimes it's confused with Veterans Day. Veterans Day all honors all veterans. Memorial Day honors the soldiers who died while serving. 1966, President Johnson named Waterloo, New York, as the beginning of Memorial, as the start of Memorial Day. There were more American lives lost during the Civil War than the two world wars combined. 300,000 fallen soldiers were buried in Arlington Cemetery, and they're averaging 28 a day. Our war memorials are way for ways for us to remember the sacrifices of ordinary men and women who gave their lives to defend this country. They gave their lives for the safety and freedom of others and their brothers and their sisters. The United States, the eastern seaboard, on through to the Mississippi Delta, it's marked those little historical markers. You never know. Chancellorville, Battle of the Wilderness, and Tiedem. Gettysburg. Poppies are growing in Flanders. France, Belgium, the beaches of Normandy, islands across the Pacific. Hills that look like they're from another planet with only a number to identify them in Korea. The jungles of Vietnam and the deserts in Iraq and Afghanistan are just some of the sites where Americans have breathed their last breath defend this country. Thank God gave us the ability, hardwired us with the ability to recognize and remember the sacrifice of others. And as I pray about what the Holy Spirit wanted me to speak to you about this week, remembering and the sacrifice kept coming back to me. We honor those who didn't make it home, but I think we need to remember those that didn't come back to the person that they loved farther than died over there. They may have been physically changed or they may have been mentally and spiritually changed by what they saw, what they had to do. For years I didn't understand when our dad didn't he suddenly talk about what he did in Korea. And I didn't understand why he had to sleep close to a window. And I didn't understand why he didn't watch war movies. And I had the last 10, 12 years of his life, I understood more. 
And Memorial Day is part of the problem, but in some ways those that come back are changed. And those people that left do not, have not returned. And we shouldn't forget them on this day because they were changed. I'm pretty sure, I guarantee you, by some of the people that were celebrating and were honoring. Memorials are built by men, but often inspired by God. In God's word, their examples of God commanding the people to build altars to remember events. This scripture comes from Joshua chapter 4, and if you have your Bibles, I'm going to get you to turn into that. I think there's a lot of significance in this scripture about the way God uses the memorials. I'm starting off uh, verses 1 through 3. And what happened, the Israelites had gone through their time in the wilderness. They were out of the desert. They had wandered 40 years. And finally, they were ready to cross the Jordan into their promised land. Verse 3, 2 and 3, God told Joshua, Tell a member of each of the 12 tribes to take a stone. Mount here from the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet were standing. <laughs> Basically, leave one and carry one. The distance from Egypt to Israel was a little over 300 miles. The Israelites could have gotten there a lot sooner, but they were made to wander until an entire generation had passed away because they broke their covenant with God. In verses 4 and 5, Joshua told men like God had instructed and told them to bring over the ark. And if you think about it, doesn't our military, aren't they representatives from every walk of our society? Rich, poor, white, black, Hispanic. Our memorials for our following reflect the different stones that make up our country. And when all the tribes of Israel came together, it was something special. And just like when our country comes together, it's something special. Who will ever, and the kids, y'all might not, y'all probably weren't here for this, but who will ever forget September 12th, 2001? After the 9 11 attacks, for a few days, you had a country in unison that moved like fingers on a hand, so coordinated. It was something special. And in verses 6, 7, and 8, Joshua said, let this be a sign to you that when your children ask later, what do these stones mean to you? It will be a reminder of what God did at this place at this time. Because as they were crossing the Jordan, they assembled these 12, 12 stones, and then they took 12 from the middle of the Jordan. They crossed the waters of the Jordan, returned to normal. And they carried the 12 stones with them. God realizes we often forget what he's done for us. And it's easy to. <clears throat> Everything's going well. Hunky dory. God's in the background. Now, you notice when you're walking into the office this week, thermostat is set on 69 to 74 and climbing. And that actually happened to us this week in also, the price of Freon's doubled, but you probably realize how I know that now. And it's like, oh, Lord. That's the first thing you say, oh, Lord. And you come right back to him. We can forget how much we depend on God. We can forget what God does for us. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 12, Moses issued a final warning to Israel just before they entered the promised land. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. This is one of the verses that worries me. We forget. We forget as individuals. We forget as families. We forget as nations. 
first time Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan where those priests have been and they're there to this day now the Jordan River is very important to the people of Israel it's mentioned 185 times in the Bible why would Joshua set up an altar in the middle of the Jordan River where no one would see it when would people see this memorial only be seen in times of drought and famine. Joshua knew the people would need a reminder of what God did and does for them when times were bad. Those 12 stones. A reminder that God's here when everything seems so bad. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians verse 12, but chapter 12, verse 9. But his answer was, My grace is all that you need. For my power is greatest when you are weak. I am most happy then to be proud of my weaknesses to feel the protection of Christ's power over me. I gotta say, I'm not, it's hard for me to be happy in my powers of weak in my times of weakness. How many of us are fixers? How many of us are fixers? We want to fix it. Even when it's somebody else, we want to fix it. When you see someone that has a knot in their tie that's not quite right, isn't some part of you want to go over it? Yes, and it's hard to admit that we're weak and we can't. And that when we are able to fix something, is it us or is it God using us? <coughs> Verse 10, the priest carried ark from standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was complete. And that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people. According to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, and the people hurried and crossed. Sometimes people think that Christians aren't men to fight or defend themselves. I know as my dad, as our dad got um, worse in his dementia, he had mentioned about some of the things that he had to do in the war. Just very little, he would just ask questions you think God understands. I think he does. I think people are called to fight. It's not fun. But Christians are called to stand up. Evil triumphs when good men do nothing. Nehemiah verses four, uh, chapter four, verses seventeen and eighteen. And this is when the temple of Israel was being rebuilt. Who were building on the wall? Those who carried burdens were loaded in such way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. <coughs> and each of the builder had swords strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Peter, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Numbers 31, verse 3. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm men from among you for the war, that they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's visions on me. Even Jesus said, Luke 22, verse 36. He said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. First time Jesus sent out his disciples, he wanted them to trust God for everything they need. And also, it's the first time they were going out to people. No one had ever heard the gospel before. And they weren't really that hostile towards it. Second time, this was towards the end of Jesus' ministry. He knew they would be persecuted. And they, they might actually need a sword to defend themselves. Now we're skipping over to verse 14. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, so they revered him just as they revered Moses all the days of his life. Joshua was a successor to Moses, handpicked by God. He was an ordinary man that God used to do extraordinary things. And how many men and women have been used in our military through the years to save lives and do God's work in some of the most dangerous places on earth? They might be carrying medicines, bandages, instead of guns and ammo. And Jesus made it very plain in Matthew 25, verse 40. The king replies, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Nurses, medics, doctors, techs all over the world. Love in action.
Jackson. Verse 15, now the Lord said to Joshua, command the priest to carry the ark of the testimony that come up into Jordan. And so Joshua did, told him, and uh, Jordan, he opened up. It was amazing. It was a reminder of what happened in Exodus, in chapter 14, verse 22. Now they came up, and they camped, in verse 19, at Gilgal. And you'll probably see some churches named that. Gilgal is, uh, I know there's Baptists, there's Methodists, I think, on the eastern edge of Jericho. Now Jericho was one of the most important cities in the Near East. They have, even now, there's a city there at that site. And they, um, the walls of Jericho, archaeologists have confirmed those walls were as thick as they said they were in the Bible recorded. Heavily defended, and they were full of pagans and great threats to God's people. The people in Canaan knew they were coming. People are afraid of what they don't know. People are afraid. Even today, they're not afraid of being burned out. They're afraid of the spiritual mirror. Their relationship with Jesus forces them to look at. And it's easier to demonize believers. Just like sometimes we go out and we talk about people and this and that, and it's easy to talk about addicts and mental illness and all this, but when you put a face to it and a name to it, the story behind it, it's a whole lot harder. I wish we could start putting more faces and names to it. That kid didn't want to grow up being an addict. I've never heard a child say that. Someone says they have asthma, diabetes, thyroid issues. Oh yeah, that's terrible. I have bipolar disorder. Change that reaction. I don't have bipolar disorder, even though I'm probably I'm nutty enough on my own without that. Chemical issues cause all of them. Hormonal differences, but just the change in that. I used that example with some of my nursing students to help them recognize the stigma that it carries with the initiative. Americans have faced numerous enemies through the decades that have been powerful in the enemies of God. Axis. Allies of World War I. ISIS. Al-Qaeda. Big Mekong. We face enemies today. In verses 20 through 24, they took those stones they had taken from the Jordan River, 12 of them, one from each tribe. And at that campsite, they set up an altar. He said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea. He dried up before us before we had crossed. That all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Fear is something not as we understand today. I love horror movies. I love to be like scared and those direct to video movies from the 80s and 90s. I watch now, I have a little nostalgia. Fear in this is respect and humility towards God. One of our biggest blocks to prayer is humility. I need you. I cannot do this without you. And it is very hard. It's hard for us to take it out of our hands. It's hard for us to admit we can't do this. It's hard for us to admit we fall. That's the start of this. These people trusted God and He got them through. 
It's very significant, I think, to look at this memorial. Twelve stones, one from each part of this nation. There's 57,000 names on that monument, on that wall, all parts of this nation. World War II Memorial, Korean War Memorial, all parts of this nation. It's identical to the memorial Joshua left in the middle of the Jordan River. And the worst times like a drought. And the best times like coming to a home that you were promised. The end of a long journey that you thought would never end. Same exact memorial. These stones are a sign that God's with us. They're a sign of God's love for us. The ultimate sign that this love is Jesus Christ. And there's comparisons. Jesus came here for us and spilled his blood and died for us as a sacrifice for us all. And as we get ready to go to prayer and begin our song, go to the altar, I want us to think about the families that lost these sons and daughters and husbands and wives and mamas and dads. And those that didn't get the same person back to them. Those that grabbed hold and they just, they loved them even more when those people didn't even love themselves. Who gave who they were for the country, their families, and complete strangers. Let's pray for all those who are grieving their loss for comfort. The healing will be in a way we don't understand because you're not ever going to heal and forgive. But pray for comfort and I love knowing it's okay and not be okay. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than one lay down his life for his friends. Y'all, let me get you standing with me. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and meet you. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. Father, we lift up every family that's going to a cemetery. Father, we lift up those that may be made home, but they're never the same. We lift up all these family members, Father. We lift up all these veterans that are fighting the battles. And Father, we just ask that you give them comfort. Tell them well done, good and faithful servant. Bring them a peace in their heart that they have not known in a long time. And Father, help these families to understand it's okay to grieve, it's okay to cry. Even you cried, Father, when you were down here. Father, help them to hold on to promises. And Father, any that might be mad at you, angry with you, and that's common when you go through a loss and you don't understand why. And Father, there are things I don't understand why that we just ask that you open their hearts up to. And Father, as we look at the memorials, help us see the faces. Help us see the faces. And Father, help us carry that love. And help us carry the, help us start seeing the faces behind all these other things, Father. Not just the memorials, but the homeless, the addictions, and then all the other things that we have here. Father, help us to unite. Help us to unite and honor these memorials and honor these people that their sacrifices are not in vain. To help us to be the land that you and the people that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray.